Um, I'm very pleased to be able to open up the Future Dams webinar series uh, for this um, academic year. Um, we've been running webinars over the last uh, three, four years, focusing very much upon uh, classical academic um, presentations of work in progress or papers just published. But uh, we're bringing Future Dams towards a conclusion uh, in spring next year. And so for this round, we're going to have a um, look at the really big issues and uh, include people who are researchers, but also include people who are working to promote uh, the, the more sustainable use of water and of the, the benefits that water can provide for humanity and for the, uh, the environment. If I can welcome all of you to this uh, first session, uh, I think we've got quite a few Future Dams partners here, but I think there's also quite a few uh, additional people who are coming from outside of the Future Dams partnership. So welcome to all of you. Now today uh, we've got Akim Steiner um, with us and he's going to look at water, energy and sustainable development, uh, past, present and future, thinking about what's happened in the past, what we have learned from that, thinking about where we're up to now and thinking about these transitions that we are going to have to achieve successfully if we want humanity to continue to be able to prosper, if we want to live in a, an environment and a world which, uh, uh, which is desirable. Um, the format we'll use today will be uh, of me initially asking some questions of Akim and Akim responding to those questions. And then after about 40, 45 minutes, uh, we'll pass the question and answers over to you, the audience. Um, we may be able to look at who's got questions, but ideally, if you could put your questions into the chat box uh, towards the end of uh, Akim's uh, talk, then we'd be able to look at those and not, uh, not spend too much time trying to get the, the questions um, out. Um, it, it, we're also fortunate today, I think um, we've got Deborah Moore, who was actually one of the uh, commissioners on the World Commission for Dams, and I think Akim and Deborah know each other from, uh, yeah, from a few years ago when uh, they were looking uh, closely at uh, the work of the World Commission on Dams and how dams should be fitting into, uh, into development. Um, and we give Deborah a chance to comment or ask a, a question of uh, Akim too. Um, if I can just uh, introduce Akim, I'll do it in a very condensed way because if you do look at his CV, he has done a lot of remarkable uh, jobs in that. Um, Akim Steiner now heads the UNDP, the United Nations Development Programme, and he's vice chair of the UN's Sustainable Development Group, which sort of uh, which involves the 40 plus different UN agencies that are involved in working towards sustainable development. Um, for more than 30 years, he's been a global leader on sustainable development, on climate resilience, and looking closely at international cooperation. Uh, he's worked as a champion uh, for sustainability, for economic growth and equality for vulnerable uh, people. And most recently, as head of the UNDP, he's been a vocal advocate for the sustainable development goals, not for just talking about them, but for actually taking them forward and acting on them. Prior to UNDP, he was director of the Oxford Martin School and professorial fellow at Balliol College uh, at the University of Oxford. Um, for, I think it was about 10 years, 2006, 2016, he actually led the United Nations environmental uh, program, particularly looking at investments in clean technologies and renewable uh, uh, energy. And if that wasn't enough, then at other times, he's been director general of the United Nations office in Nairobi. Um, he's been the director general of the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, and he was um, going back 20, uh, 22 years ago, the Secretary General of the World Commission uh, on Dams. He's lived and worked I mean, across the world in Africa, Asia, Middle East, Europe, and Latin America and the USA. His uh, first degree was in philosophy, politics, and economics from Worcester College um, at Oxford. And he followed that up with a, a, an MA from uh, the School of Oriental and African uh, Studies uh, in London. So we've got a wealth of very relevant practical experience, um, and also these deep links uh, with academia. Um, so if, if I could move on to the questions, um, Akim, I mean, the, the, the first one that I was going to ask you was, um, I mean, what are the main ways uh, in which the human use of water and energy has changed over the last um, 
30 years and, and if you could identify those and maybe think about why those changes have happened and how, you know, what, what pushed them to happen. David, thank you very much. And first of all, um, what a privilege to join you and, and to interact with the group. And I just looked at the screen and I'm sure I'm going to spot um, more friends and colleagues and critics from my past. So I see Deborah, first of all, Deborah, very nice to see you, Bill Adams and others, but David also to just congratulate you on this future, future dams project. I think in many ways, um, it speaks to precisely the, the design challenge um, that goes well beyond the engineering of a dam and really goes into the future of development. And this is what, you know, as you said, 20 years ago, became actually the title of this um, World Commission on Dams report, Dams and Development, um, where, do we, where do we go next? But to jump straight into your question, what has driven the changes over the last 20 to 30 years? And I would begin by saying, um, you know, there are some fundamentals that have driven uh, both an understanding and awareness, but also a different set of paradigms and, um, and choices over time that are fundamentally related to two issues, inequality and sustainability. Um, let me begin with the former and begin in the present day. We still live in an age where 800 million people don't even have access to electricity. Secondly, the world is dependent on a fossil fuel based infrastructure for producing energy and mobility that is now taking us to the brink of a world that um, will lose control over what happens with climate change. So um, I think one doesn't have to say a lot more to understand that when you look at something like energy, which uh, perhaps if you go back 30, 40 years, really was something that came out of a socket. I mean, it, it was not something that you worried about in terms of where it came from. It was simply a great breakthrough in terms of development, um, having the privilege of being connected to an electricity grid. And yet much of our journey as you know, civilization, I would even say, but also as citizens living in our communities and our countries and learning more and more about what was happening around us, was to begin to understand that uh, these things don't just come out of a socket or water doesn't just come out of a tap and then disappears you know, into some sewage drain. We are part of a hydrological system. We are part of a uh, economic system and we are also part of a, a social system. And all of these, I think, have increasingly um, revealed stress factors. We um, you know, live in a time where inequality at a moment uh, in human history where we are really the wealthiest generation is more pronounced in many societies than it has been for a long time. It doesn't mean that we are all as poor as we used to be. I mean, to those who question the, the progress that we have made, let me just remind you of a very, I think, clear statistic. Uh, 200 years ago, 250 years ago, nine out of 10 people living on this planet at the time lived in extreme poverty. Today, it is one out of 10. And yet we are seven and a half billion people compared to what was then, I think, one and a half or two billion people. So, you know, economic progress has been amazing. And that has really been the human journey for hundreds of years. And yet yeah. toward the end of the 20th century, <laughs> yeah, they confronted um, mm -hmm. what are, sorry, colleagues, somebody I think has their mic open. Um, we confront, um, first of all, that uh, confidence in our societies, in our form of governance to deliver a fair outcome in development. Poverty that prevails, inequality that becomes more pronounced really is beginning to divide our societies. It is polarizing us. And therefore, I think there is a heightened awareness that we do need to address this issue. And actually access to water and energy are two profoundly developmental, but also very individual, clearly experienceable uh, phenomena. And, you know, in this period, what we have also seen is the realization that in more and more parts of the world, there simply wasn't going to be enough water for the kind of consumption and production systems that we were relying on to generate our wealth. And there are now many river basins in the world that essentially, you know, trade water from what was originally the largest consumer agriculture to urban areas. It pays a farmer more in the Murray Darling Basin to actually trade their water rights in order to um, allow the city to have access to water than to use that water to grow crops. I mean, that's just one fundamental change in the economics of farming, for example. And, you know, in the United States, in many parts of the world, water scarcity has become a very real prospect. So to stop really at this point of saying, 
when you look at inequality and you look at sustainability, I think you have two of the key drivers that have changed, first of all, our understanding, our awareness, and our sense of urgency also in redesigning the economy around the use of water and energy, ultimately to allow it to be compatible with an ecosystem that does not destroy the ecological infrastructure that is fundamental for us to survive, never mind to generate um, you know, power development, uh, indeed food production across the world. Let me stop here for a moment. Okay, no, thanks very much for sort of identifying those two particular drivers, inequality and sustainability. And certainly a lot of the work we've been doing in future dams has, has targeted in on those two and the way that uh, yeah, to, to contribute to in a more equal world and sustainability, then we, we have to use water differently. I mean, when we look to the future, um, do you think we can achieve the goals of sustainable development in terms of water and energy? Can we really make these accessible to all, but also achieve sustainability? Well, here would be the second part of my answer to your first question that I think leads into that. Um, what are the variables that we can actually work with in changing the way we use water, the way we produce energy? And I think two things are, are fundamental here. First of all, um, the economy within which we operate. Um, you know, much of the paradigm of development has been driven by an economic view that is more akin to an extractive um, industry. You know, you, you essentially draw out of what the planet provides us, get to a higher level of development, and somehow there was always this assumption that you would be less dependent on the natural systems around us. And here we are, you know, the most technologically advanced generation in human history, and yet we are thrown back to, first of all, a phenomenon such as climate change, where just in the last few months, we have seen the catastrophic effects this has. Simple things like floods and fires are beginning to threaten the very foundation of um, you know, wealth and, and infrastructure that we have created. So I think the, the first um, focus has to be on the economic paradigm that informs both consumption and production. And really here we are being far too slow. Um, you know, we can go through the litany of issues now. Is GDP a good indicator for growth? Is growth in itself actually something that defines really successful development? Um, right down to the kind of taxation system where we continue to tax one of the best things that we have in our society, which is work. We work, we earn a living, we get satisfaction out of our work, and we continue to tax that as the principal source of revenue for public um, fiscal policy. And yet, there has been a debate for years about shifting the burden of taxation away from something that is principally a good, namely work and labor and jobs, to taxing the bads that are undermining our economic well-being, our human well-being. So environmental tax reforms, tackling fossil fuel subsidies that the IMF estimates now cost us between four to five trillion dollars a year in their compound impact on our societies. They are economically inefficient, they distort and also prevent and here I come to my second point, the advent of new technological possibilities. The you know, clean energy revolution, and I would, I would strongly argue that in fact we are already in the midst of seeing an energy revolution unfold, is going to take us, my prediction, certainly contestable, over the next 30 years from an age in which we spend probably the better part of three to 400 years basing our entire economic advancement and development on fossil fuels. And yet in 30 years, I believe we will be in an entirely new age where access to energy as such will no longer be a constraint. I mean, if you just look at renewable energy technology, um, the supply of energy, so to speak, onto the planet is inexhaustible. Our only challenge is how do we shift rapidly to an energy infrastructure, a mobility infrastructure, an urban infrastructure that allows us to make that the platform on which we generate the power we need for our, our economies, for our daily lives. And yet, yes, I think there are many who rightly would be frustrated with the lack of progress, but just look at the last few years. I mean, we are in the midst of seeing entire economies shift onto renewable energy platforms. I think we're going to see mobility transition in less than two decades from a you know um, petrol and diesel based engine technology into electric and hydrogen technology. So in less than a generation, perhaps the most profound technological advance that we will have seen. Add to that digitalization, and you begin to see why there are reasons 
to say we have choices that we can make. There are choices to be made. And I think they have a lot to do with the design of our economic policy, regulatory framework that incentivizes or disincentivizes certain types of consumption and production. And at the same time, the advent of new technological and scientific possibilities that are without precedent in human history. If, if I can just follow up on that on some of the work that Future Dams has been doing, I think if one looks at our, our team of researchers uh, and one looks at the idea of, uh, of technological change and uh, rapidly advancing technology, um, we've got some uh, team members who are optimists, particularly looking at renewables and in a way both the, the move to renewable technologies, but also the incredible drop in price of renewables and the way that yeah they are they are cheaper now than many fossil fuels it's if we could remove the subsidies then the same thing to do would be to to move into these rapidly developed technologies uh, we've got a number of pessimists uh, and what they look at is carbon sequestration and they think that the projections about the technical advances that will occur in sequestration um, are just too optimistic and given that we can't plant all of the farmed land with trees to sequester carbon, then in, in, in a way, there's certainly a big question for future dams is what's going to happen with carbon uh, sequestration and, and uh, how could that be uh, be advanced? I, I know, are you more optimistic about that? Is that the one we should be worried about? Look, sometimes I feel almost a bit like a Luddite when I speak about carbon sequestration, because frankly, so far, I have seen very little that persuades me that uh, the technological uh, frontier of carbon sequestration is um, likely to be the optimal pathway. I know it is a possibility. I know it is something that um, for more and more people becomes a sort of last resort um, in terms of dealing with carbon emissions as they obviously um, expect them not to be reduced quickly enough. But um, frankly speaking, um, if you have you know, $1, a $1 billion dollars or a trillion dollars, if you were to ask me where do you invest, it's in decarbonization, not in trying to find a technological fix for a world that will soon be 10 billion people. And if it believes that it doesn't have to decarbonize, there is no way you can sequestrate that amount of carbon. Meanwhile, in the short term, I think there is a carbon sequestration dimension, which has to do with our ecological infrastructure. And here is the great co-benefit. As we look at how we can, first of all, stop the destruction of uh, nature. Secondly, make the investment in maintaining ecological infrastructure, um, be it forests, be it wetlands, peatlands, and so on, restore some of these ecosystems. We have a dual net benefit, but it will not be enough to deal with a you know, uh, 2021 global economy of emissions. So, our focus must absolutely be uh, oriented around the challenge of decarbonization. And frankly speaking, I actually would challenge those who um, are pessimistic, not in the sense that our greatest challenge will be the time window. Unfortunately, we are now at T minus nine, so to speak, um, which is by 2030, we are likely to cross a threshold, which is a point of no return on a certain amount of global warming being locked in. It's a frighteningly short timeline. Our challenge is a race against time, not about ultimately how to power and sustain um, eight, nine billion people on this planet. We are perfectly capable of doing that, but we have to transform our economies from the production to the consumption. And then I think here, I would urge those who you know, want to explore a technological uh, you know, widget, so to speak, by all means, go ahead. And if it is economically viable, it'll be part of the toolbox that we have available to deal with carbon emissions. But at the moment, we are at a level of strategic choices and bets we have to make. And um, I would put virtually all of my money on the decarbonization pathway, because I think it is the only way with an accelerated and exponential curve that we have a chance to actually get to grips with a climate change phenomenon that in turn can also provide us with solutions that have so many co-benefits. I mean, just the the simple amount of investment we could bring back into our ecosystems. Um, the fact that we no longer have to rely on fossil fuels with all the pollution and the 7 million premature death every year that we have from outdoor and indoor pollution. We just managed only now to phase out lead finally in the last country in petrol around the world. Uh, it took us the better part of 40 years to do something that was technologically perfectly feasible. Why did it not happen? 
because some had invested in you know, refineries and therefore that capital was very patient in actually trying to get its return on investment and stop sometimes national economies from simply you know, outlawing lead in petrol. So you know, we have to tackle the real constraints here head on. And then I believe transitions and transformations are perfectly viable that don't require us to rely on things that may be feasible or may even be in the realm of science fiction at the moment. Not that they are unimaginable, but you know, time, time, it's a race against time that we find ourselves in today. Okay, no, thanks for that. And if any of our pessimists, they may come back with some questions um, when, we, when, we, when we hand over there. I mean, to, to move on to a point you were partly making at the end there. Um, I mean, clearly we need to accelerate uh, progress towards sustainability and accelerate what we learn and how to sort of improve our policies more effectively. I wonder if I can take you back a, a little historically and get you to think about the World Commission um, on dams and that. Um, I mean, in what ways did the World Commission on dams push forward learning and you know, lead to changes? I mean, there was obviously controversy at the end and um, a certain negative press, but clearly, I think as the, the work that we've been doing, the World Commission on Dams in a way, it wasn't just a direct force, the knowledge it created also had a sort of indirect element. So, I mean, can we learn from, from experience? And, you know, looking back, what did the World Commission on Dams um, achieve? Well, let me begin by acknowledging it did not achieve universal peace. Um, it was born out of controversy and it also landed in a world um, that was still very polarized. But, you know, um, I take some solace from the fact that, you know, more than 20 years after that extraordinary group of commissioners, and Deborah, I'm sure, can speak to that, it was an extraordinary experience, profoundly uh, changing in my own understanding of development also and how you deal with issues that. Um, you know, often divide our societies profoundly in the choices we make, the things we so-called use trade-offs for. But I think the fact that this report remained a reference point in the, in the debate on dams essentially um, reflected one very fundamental shift, which was that the construction of dams, first of all, was um, a civilizational journey that took human ingenuity engineering, hydrology, and all the things that came with it to a new level of sophistication. It climaxed somewhere in probably the middle of the 20th century and certainly passed its peak towards the end of it because it became a technology that increasingly had to be understood as not a product of you know, engineering uh, and hydrology and uh, you know, river basin management, but had to be understood as a profound intervention in systems, social, economic, ecological systems. And I think what the, com the commission and the report gave expression to was the implications of embracing that understanding to how you would go about deciding in future whether to build a dam or not. And interesting enough, you know, we still, and I saw recently um, a blog from Jamie Skinner also, where it referred to, um, you know, who was also part of the secretariat at the time, is part of your future dams consortium on carbon pricing and climate financing and you know, hydropower and the IHA sustainability guidelines. One element of it is the you know, numbers element of measuring you know, cost, return on investment, carbon emissions embedded in a you know, kilowatt hour produced by a dam. But that was just a one dimensional view of it. I think the commission established without you know, really being able to go back to anything else, a three dimensional view of it. If you build a dam, you're intervening in systems. So your answer is going to be determined by how people understand the impact of that dam in these systems. And I think that is why one of the, I think, incontestable findings around which all the commissioners could come together is that the biggest mistake is made at the point where you decide to build a dam or not to build a dam. The options assessment, looking at the alternatives on the one hand, profoundly important because very often dams were built because somebody decided this was a brilliant thing to do. And then all sorts of interests, you know, uh, congregate around these mega projects. They were the great, you know, illustrations of development breakthroughs, finances like these concentrated capital investment projects. And here comes the second part. We actually agreed in the commission not to use the term trade-offs anymore. It's something I have maintained for myself ever since for the simple reason that what is embedded in this notion of trade-off 
is that ultimately in an unequal society with unequal opportunities to shape a decision, a trade-off is one group deciding for another what is good or bad um, for them. And I think dams, you know, and we've always argued that also in the commission, are in themselves neither good nor bad. What determines their value or in a sense their impact, positive or negative, is how they impact on people, on ecology, on economic systems. And these are, you know, partly ecological criteria, partly they are social and equitable criteria. And I think the commission managed to provide with its rights and risks framework, a new way of um, holding accountable those who want to advocate for dams, but also providing those who are affected by dams, but we're never at the table of making first of all an options assessment, then determining the corresponding choices. How much mitigation would you design into a dam, for example? Yes, it costs money to the developer, but nobody in the past really accounted for the cost to those living downstream, to the loss of ecological productivity in the river basin, the cost of environmental flows. And so I think in part, we also learned from the United States. You know, there are very interesting phenomena where the United States is one of the you know, greatest builder of large dams in the 19th, 20th century. By the late 20th century, ended up uh, investing billions of dollars in buying back water in order to ensure environmental flows. Um, you know, salmon are transported downstream, upstream in order to avoid the extinction of, of, of species. And the Congress authorizes these funds because essentially dams are privately run. So you have to buy back that water that would otherwise you know, be used to produce power in order to maintain ecological viability. So that paradigm shift, I think is just one illustration of how societies are making very different choices in today's world partly because they have seen also the bitter irony as we did as a commission. When you looked at dams that were built 10, 20 years before to power an economy, to bring electricity to people, and then the very people who were resettled to make room for that dam live 20 miles downstream without one PowerPoint 20 years later, you actually saw the irony of, of you know, bringing power to the people and often dams becoming really, um, a looking glass through which you saw the sometimes unintended or sometimes simply accepted consequences of dam building. Some of them are necessary, some of them inevitable, and yet even acceptable. And I think, in a nutshell, the rights and risks framework, with an options assessment put right up front, gave expression to something that I think by now has been, in a sense, mainstreamed, appropriated through many different constituencies and continues to shape the way in which we look at dams as an option. Okay, no, th thanks for taking us back um, uh, and, and reflecting on that contribution that, uh, that the World Commission on Dams was, uh, was able to, uh, to make. And if we could, I mean, I know UNDP is not a major player in building dams or, or managing dams, but uh, I wonder if we could move on to those and just get you to, to tell us a little bit about how you think dams will fit into the sort of transition to renewable energy, because we've increasingly in future dams been talking about, you know, I mean, grid stability through the use of dams and dams I mean, as a storage device for electricity. But we're often surprised that yeah, if we talk to engineers, then they're thinking hydropower and it's the it's how much hydro it's, it's not how it might fit into these more complicated energy systems we're moving to. So I wonder if I could ask you a little bit about dams and this more complicated system that we're going to move to. Well, look, I mean, there is something immensely enticing about um, harnessing the power of nature. I think this is what drove dam building. I mean, the idea that you would let a river simply flow into the sea when you could actually be producing, you know, a quarter, a third of your national power needs or satisfy them by building a dam, simply capturing the water, letting it run through, it drives a turbine and, you know, millions of light bulbs go on. I mean, there is a very simple and compelling logic that drove that view. And you know, our understanding of intervening in complex ecological systems, river basins and so on, um, really only began to emerge um, with the 20th century. And then in the second half of the 20th century, we saw not only the impacts locally, which local communities could already see much earlier, but we saw the compounded impacts. I mean, when you look at the number of rivers um, which no longer reach the sea, if you look at how much water 
has in a sense been uh, retained or not made available to a functioning ecosystem by the sheer mass of, of the tens of thousands of large dams that have been built around the world. And, um, you know, that compounded impact, I think, very much led to um, an understanding that you cannot just look at a dam from that design option. I mean, in, in many ways, it's, you know, it's a temple of human ingenuity when you look at some of these large dams. No, no question about it. But you cannot, and I say this with all the respect for engineers, you cannot let engineers decide for a society whether a dam is, in fact, the best option for a society to build at that moment. And first of all, we have many more alternatives today in terms of power generation. So I think that notion that hydropower is the singular driver of uh, the construction of, of large dams in the future is in part being overtaken by the ubiquitousness and the economics of other renewable energy sources. So let's not project into dams this um, you know, universal tool to somehow produce power in a greener way, in inverted commas. Secondly, I think there is a clear challenge, and in many countries, storage clearly is something that dams can provide and reservoirs. The question is, um, when is it the best option versus other options? We clearly are in a, in a, in a moment of extreme uh, transformation. Battery technology is at the moment um, one avenue. Hydrogen is another emerging one. All of these are in the midst of sort of almost equivalent early industrial revolution leaps forward. So. In the short term, I think there will be still places in the world where building a, a dam and a reservoir and where hydropower then becomes a kind of additional benefit that makes it maybe economically more viable um, certainly is an option that, that countries will look at. Um, the question is, will we then examine that option of, of storage, for instance, including for irrigation and food production, which is not to be you know, underestimated either, as something that is singularly determining whether we build a dam or will we be able to put this on the table with all the other considerations? And I think where we're ending, you know, ultimately going to end up is there will be dams that will still be built. Hopefully they will be built, first of all, out of a very rigorous assessment of all options. And second, in a far more transparent and democratic fashion. Um, and you know, one interesting illustration of that was the debate we had in the World Commission on Dams and that continues in many parts of the world which related to this notion of prior informed consent, for example, for indigenous peoples, or the notion of eminent domain, which became also um, a 20th century tool by which you know, building a highway was declared in the public interest. Whoever was in the way was essentially moved by law and then compensated or not, as the case may be. We live in a different age. You cannot simply um, you know, decide over an indigenous people's community in the name of national development. So finding ways in which that decision-making process becomes far more cognizant of fundamental rights on the one hand, but also the obligation to then um, find solutions and compensation that allows people who maybe sacrifice their land or their livelihoods for the greater good to not be the net losers in this process. And I think there a lot has been learned in recent years. And I think sometimes it actually led to the decision not to build a dam. And on other occasions, it actually produced a dam that very few people would argue with was a bad choice. Okay, no, that, that's that's really fascinating on that. And that, that maybe takes us into, well, just the broader question about planning in general. And if we're thinking about water and energy and how it relates to the environment and food and uh, 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 UNDP, I mean, it'd be great if we could hear about dams and water management, but just more broadly, I mean, our systems of planning changing, certainly those of us who work in academia are finding that planners rather than be seen as experts are increasingly seen as the people who should convene. <laughs> the main parties together. So they don't take the decision, but they in a way are facilitators, which is a quite different idea. But I mean, are these ideas, yeah. Are they just what we talk about in universities or are they beginning to impact on the UNDP? Oh, I think profoundly. In fact, um, very often I would argue uh, that UNDP as the United Nations Development Program is invited in as a partner precisely because it brings a perspective, it brings a normative set of um, you know, values that it also adds to a national, sometimes contested terrain around many different decisions that are taken in development. And you know, 
as a partner, you obviously don't determine an outcome, but you can inform it. You can bring best practices. And I, you, you know, UNDP is an organization with um, you know, 4,500 projects being implemented at any moment in time. We operate in 170 countries. We are embedded in so many different national development um, processes, planning processes. One of the things that we can achieve is to allow countries to have the benefit of, first of all, experiences from others. Secondly, sometimes having um, a partner who is not party to the national dispute can also be part of convening. But to your point, I think at the end of the day, yes, national planning is not about selling a predetermined solution. It is allowing a country with all its different interests and sometimes very unequal means of participating in the planning process to be at the table. And that was really where, you know, beyond the dams issue, the, w, the World Commission dams actually, I think, provided a profound articulation with its rights and risks framework of how public planning should in fact take place. It's, you know, some viewed it as idealized, but, you know, everything in life starts with where you would ideally like to be, and then you try and make it work in the real world. And I think planners, and particularly national planning, um, you know, has an extraordinary responsibility because there is always the temptation, either by, a, you know, a newly elected government, we want to do something in four years, when really, if you look at a at, at managing water resource in a country, a four-year government elected cycle is anathema to long-term sustainable planning. So what is the continuity we provide um, in the public planning arena? How can we also have citizens um, not just feel that they only have, in a sense, the, the court as a legal resort, last resort? In many countries, you have the proverbial, oh, you know, because of one frog species, an entire, you know, major project will create 20,000 jobs cannot be built. And even Elon Musk is, uh, you know, having trouble with some ecological concerns that have arisen about his mega battery factory just outside Berlin that he wants to put up in less than two years. You know, unfortunately, the reason why sometimes we end up in these complete standoffs is that we begin far too late to think about creative and smart solutions. You know, there are going to be losses sometimes in nature. I mean, when you build something, you are converting land into something else. The question is, does it have to be a net negative um, outcome or can you do things? And I'm not arguing that mitigation solves everything, but design can solve certain things. The way that you look at material cycles, supply chains, I mean, all of this is part of reinventing the way we manufacture, we produce, and we ultimately run our economies. And I think that's where planning and planners are in a sense, um, I think in need of a, well, they're also having it already, a completely new set of tools, but also different mandates. And that doesn't deny the need for experts. I mean, I, for example, have argued very strongly in the last few years, as I looked at the ministries of finance around the world, I was astonished that two, three years ago, the vast majority of them did not have one climate change expert in their ministry. Now, if you listen to how profoundly important it is how ministers of finance look at investments, taxation, fiscal policy, to dealing with the challenge of climate change, you can only scratch your head and say, how is that possible? So interdisciplinary ideas are not new. How you translate that competence into a public planning and a public decision-making process, um, I think is still something we're struggling with in many, many parts of the world. Okay, no, th th thanks for that answer. If I could ask you about a, a particular organizational technology, which again, Future Dams is finding out. I mean, we're finding certainly the scientific community, the physical scientific community is getting deeply interested in the idea of citizens assemblies in a way. Um, and clearly these have great potential, but there's also a danger that they're suddenly recommended as some sort of uh, solving all sorts of problems, but um, I, I don't know, have you got any thoughts on citizens' assemblies? Have you played with those or used those? Part of what we, I think, do every day is looking at how we can make people part of the process of arriving at a decision and at a set of choices. So I think citizen assemblies are a particular form of, you know, codifying and institutionalizing the participation of the public in the way we you know, run our economies and run our societies. Now, I think to answer that generically, obviously, is sometimes a little bit risky. I mean, when you, uh, you know, 
um, are talking about what kind of digital ecosystem would we like to have um, shape our future economy, our society. I think citizens have an absolutely central role to play. You know, fundamental privacy are as important as the last mile of a fiber optic cable. Again, in this digital uh, revolution that we are living through right now that is profoundly transforming every aspect of development, there is again that tendency to think that it's all about broadband connectivity, you know, last mile. And first of all, yes, it's fundamental. I mean, 50% of the world's population don't have access to broadband. So digital can be profoundly um, constraining on people in terms of their opportunities. So we have to find a way to connect. But what we're really helping governments with right now in UNDP is looking at how to develop a digital ecosystem in a country in which access is one dimension, looking at curricula and training school leavers so they actually have an opportunity to succeed in that economy, looking at the finance system, how you can create credit lines for startups and small scale enterprises, because that's where much of the digital revolution emanates from. Yet in most countries, there are no developmental finance instruments for precisely that constituency. And you very quickly arrive back at a point where, you know, citizens, particularly with digital um, platforms now, I think have found another level in which collective intelligence can find expression, um, not just in terms of an opinion poll or a view on, you know, option A versus B. Uh, you know, the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds in the UK does this extraordinary bird survey every year where it invites citizens across the UK to essentially record the birds in their backyard or in one spot. It's still the largest survey of birds undertaken. This is citizen science at work. And equally, you know, we are in a, in a, in a universe where young people today are so much more informed than, than I was when I was 18 or 25. I mean, just the availability of information. So let's harness um, that collective intelligence, whether it is in an individual um, decision around maybe building a dam or not, or whether it is about the kind of paradigm that should shape a technological revolution such as digital. So I'm all in favor of citizen science, where you create assemblies, you have to start dealing with constitutional aspects. Does an assembly of citizens override a parliament? Uh, and those are issues that obviously have to do with governance. And I think we should be open to, to new solutions. We have a very established system of you know, executive, judiciary, and uh, legislative, uh, the three arms of government. Um, in part, they are meant to represent the people's interest, uh, whether in a parliament or in a court or in a government. But I think um, you know, we are a much more emancipated uh, generation in this day and age. And with the technological and the information and knowledge possibilities, I think there is much greater room for um, well, deploying that collective intelligence. It will still not resolve some fundamental disagreements over what you choose, but at least citizens will be more directly engaged and do not have to rely only on intermediated uh, views of what they think. Okay, no, that's a very interesting thinking about citizens' voice. If I can ask one last question and then we'll move across and let, let other people um, engage in the conversation. Um, when we look at dams, but when we look at most of the things that you have to work on at UNDP, then these are about multilateral action quite often. And I suppose what would be called at a more local level, multi-stakeholder uh, dialogues to look at the challenges that sustainable uh, development is creating. Um, I mean, has it got easier to, to run these sort of multi-stakeholder discussions because of the Millennium Development Goals and the Sustainable Development Goals? At one level, they would tend to suggest you know it's, it's much easier to get people around the table who are agreed on uh, on these goals but at the same time when we open our newspapers each day we find out that that there are deepening uh, tensions between the stakeholders in these complicated decisions so uh, if you tell us a little bit maybe about the way that the mdgs but particularly the sdgs the ways in which they're reshaping negotiations and dialogue well, look, let me start by saying I think life's just a lot more complicated in our day and age. I mean, we are now you know, well over 7 billion people. We are confronted with crises that um, are profoundly existential. I mean, climate change is still something that I think many people sort of, you know, categorize in the realm of somewhere between science, science fiction, and it sounds very dangerous and it's beginning to feel dangerous. And I think, you know, we still have 
um, that challenge of, of not just giving people around the world a sense of doom and gloom, but of empowering them to feel that they actually are able to make choices. And, you know, I often use the analogy of, of this notion of living in the age of the Anthropocene. Um, it is an age in which, on the one hand, we are now the most um, significant species on this planet. We are even geologically affecting the future look of, of planet Earth. We are affecting the atmosphere, the biosphere. And in that sense, it is a profoundly different age in which human decisions and, and um, choices have consequences well beyond our geographical presence where we are or live um, uh, intergenerationally. And I think human consciousness has struggled to, to catch up with this. And so, yes, there are um, many more things we have to take into account and much longer timelines also um, that will influence and determine the consequence of our decisions today. So it is more complex and multi-stakeholder processes are therefore inevitably more complex because the choices we make have to be far more precise. They have to also be far more clear about, you know, how it is in a, in a world with very unequal possibilities within a local community, you know, Greater Manchester. There are people who are living, you know, essentially just above the poverty line and there are others who, you know, can park their private jet nearby. And, you know, that's just one spectrum um, of uh, very different realities. If you're a, a developing country right now, somewhere on the continent of Africa in the midst of a pandemic, you just lived through the most brutal illustration of what it means to be poor in a pandemic. Um, it's very expensive to the point where you can't even get access to vaccines. So that is one end. We are in a far more... Um, informed society where you know decisions that are taken are far more understood by the public and therefore they will challenge and question it and remember that the years before COVID hit us we were actually going through a profoundly disruptive period I mean politics was moving onto the streets and radicalism and extremism was moving into the parliament so you know we saw the the fissures in our society and I think what they demonstrate is that the kinds of choices we have been making simply don't cut it anymore. Too many people are left behind. Too many people feel that injustice, unfairness are driving what is happening around them. So that's one thing. And secondly, you know, when you are dealing with a, a challenge of decarbonization in a period of just two to three decades, um, every single choice you now make about technology uh, in terms of the buildings you build, the power infrastructure, they matter, they will compromise or they will enable us to actually keep on track. So my take is yes, uh, let's acknowledge things are much more complex. It doesn't mean that people have less of a role to play, but we must find much better ways in which we can um, convene around complexity where expertise and science informs us, but choices are made by people who have rights, fundamental rights, and they can exercise those rights. And I think in that spirit, what, what will drive development, the future of development, frankly speaking, is an increasingly complex attempt to manage systemic change and to manage complex systems. That is, I think, the, um, the crucial variable in terms of a development competency, and that's now writ large, not development aid. Development to me in its simplest form is about choices we make, about what happens next. And I think in that respect, um, systems approaches have become absolutely essential because otherwise we will um, fail to live up to the, the challenges of our time. Okay, so now it is more complex, but we can look to these systems approaches. If, if I can give Akeem a, um, a short break now, give him ch a chance to, to get his breath back, we're gonna get a, I mean, a comment perhaps from Deborah Moore or some questions or or thoughts uh, on that. I mean, at the moment, Deborah is co-chair of the Board of International Rivers, which many of you will know, are an international organization dedicated to protecting rivers and the rights of the communities that uh, depend on them. But she's been looking at water management uh, and dams for uh, many years. She was a commissioner on the World Commission on uh, Dams, 
working closely with uh, Akim Steiner then. Uh, at that stage, I think her position was senior scientist at the Environmental Defense Fund, uh, an environmental advocacy organization. She's broadened over the years to focus much more on sustainability and education for sustainability, and was involved in the founding of the Green Schools Initiative in the USA, which is promoting environmental literacy and trying to reduce the environmental footprints um, of schools. She's also worked at the uh, Union of Concerned Scientists and with that engaged uh, in a number of initiatives to, uh, to pass California's uh, world leading, some say, uh, uh, precedent setting climate uh, change uh, and sort of 100% clean energy laws involved with the uh, introduction of electric cars, sustainable groundwater regulation and a set of problems which uh, sometimes look uh, insoluble uh, everywhere and sometimes in the USA look particularly in, in solve, unsolvable. So Deborah, can we ask you whether you want to comment or ask a question, but uh, we can give you uh, yeah four or five minutes now just to take our thinking um, yeah, forward. Great, thank you so much. Thanks for having me and uh, Akim, Professor Steiner, it's good to see you and many other WC friends, WCD friends uh, on the line and um, Jeremy Bird and Jamie Skinner and Jacques Leslie who wrote a book about the WCD. So uh, many people still involved, as you said, 20 years later. Um, I've been thinking about yeah, what's changed in the last 20 years? Um, certainly I have some more gray hair. Uh, my daughter was three years old when the, WC, when the WCD started and she's now 26 and a first year student in medical school. So that's a big change. And we've also lost a lot of colleagues like Honorable Cutter Asmal and many others. And it is a new generation of youth climate activists and others, you know, rising up, um, justice movements, climate movements. So that I think has also changed in the last 20 years. We've seen the rights of nature growing. Um, as Akim said, free prior and informed consent is uh, an area, a policy area that I think um, the WCD pioneered and that has spread over the last 20 years and We've made progress in some areas, but I don't think it's news to anyone on this webinar that um, the real world indicators, uh, particularly for freshwater ecosystems, are catastrophic. Um, and so we've had scientists having, you know, peer reviewed journal articles warning to humanity about the freshwater crisis. Um, and we've had people like Ted Scudder, who was a commissioner. Uh, who had always been quite optimistic about can we make dams better? Um, and after you know, 60 year career, he has actually decided no. <laughs> he doesn't. He no longer thinks there's um, such a thing as a as a good dam. Um, and so you know, Akim, you and I have had different paths. You've been on the inside doing good work, and I've remained on the outside as part of. Um, those citizen movements uh, calling for change. And so I guess I'm, I'm really interested, you know, the, the, the second half of the WCD report title was, um, you know, dams and development, and then a new framework for decision making. And you were talking about that in the last part, in particular about multi stakeholder decision making, and it is complex, and we do need to look at systems. Um, but I'm kind of curious to really hear more like personally from you as someone who's been on the inside and someone who has power, you're in the halls of power. Why are financiers and governments continuing to approve such failed approaches? We've got 3,700 dams in the pipeline. If these are built, we would further lose something like 20% of our remaining free flowing rivers right on the brink of, you know, ecosystem collapse and fisheries extinction and all kinds of other things. So why is that continuing to happen? What are the biggest barriers to the kinds of transformative change that we're talking about? 
Um, what really persuades people in power? People like you, you have power. Um, and so also what are your kind of directions to those of us on the outside for like what is most effective at persuading those in power? Um, what has changed people's minds? Um, because the science is clear, the majority of the public supports environmental protection. The stories of what's happening to those most at risk are immoral and heartbreaking. And as you yourself said, we're running out of time. And so I think our lives and well being virtually, literally, vitally depend on us changing course. Um, and so how can that happen faster? How can we more persuade people like you and the, and the people you associate with to do things differently? Because we, we haven't changed enough in the last 20 years. So Akim, uh, yeah, question from Deborah there about how we can do better, how we can work faster and the real challenge to the 3,700 dams that have been talked about, the fact we still look to dams um, for the future, but this may not match the sorts of knowledge that WCD was making. Um, any guidance on this? Any thoughts? Well, um, let me first of all acknowledge, I think, Deborah, that, um, you know, power is an overrated phenomenon. Um, being on the inside, I, I have to recognize that every day. And, um, you know, sometimes, you know, the power to influence is significant when you're on the inside. But the power to influence is also significant on the outside. And why do I say that? Because I think more often than not, um, when you work on the inside of the system, you're essentially working with existing laws of gravity and you know, vested interests and so on. So you have to, in a sense, continuously push the frontier of knowledge and of options and in an indirect way of constituency building. Because you know, the reason why stupid projects get approved or you know the wrong kind of infrastructure is built is you know rarely because of a lack of insight and yes there is you know a lot we have learned about ecology and about how you know resettlement programs have often failed to actually deliver on their promises but it's more out of a convergence of of um, interests you know a government wants to have a powerful symbol of um, development the financing world is so used to directing its investments through established channels and you know to suggest to them to run a distributed off-grid uh, um, scheme to produce an equivalent uh, amount of power you know a thousand megawatts with solar panels simply eluded the imagination of many until a few years ago and you know there are vested interests also and then let's not underestimate the public in many countries will look at some of these projects also differently. I mean, if you're in the United States in the year 2021, you will look at large dams very differently to somebody living in the Democratic Republic of Congo, right? Where one of the largest dams keeps always looming on the horizon of capturing this extraordinary amount of water power that is uh, you know, simply not being utilized. How does one change this? I think we have seen in the last few years in the climate change arena, that sometimes you don't need power, you need conviction. And you need a smart way of reaching out and connecting people. Um, you know, when a 14 year old girl with a poster, um, you know, kind of sets off, um, not a movement because that sentiment was there, but what, you know, Greta Thunberg provided at the moment in time was a way for many people to feel that they could connect. And I think to me, it has been fascinating to see how, you know, teenagers have shifted the the climate debate significantly simply by being at you know the dining table in the evening with their families in their school in their community and i think you know like all movements in history that change things at the end of the day you need to get people to stand up and um, you know essentially first of all be able to engage in a public debate about do we have options because very often these projects are presented as well, there is no alternative. Well, we know from history that rarely is that the truth. And I think there is a degree in which, uh, to which one has to acquire that competence. And you have been in the organizations that you have been part of and led, there were exactly that. 
that's how you build uh, muscle power for movement. And then I think the organizational uh, networking um, and movement building is still the thing that ultimately drives, I think, a society towards taking different decisions. My ability, for example, as head of UNDP, indeed, you could say, you know, you run one of the largest development organizations in the world. I mean, how can you claim not to have power? I have the power to inform, to influence. I have the power to say no, but I don't have the power to tell a country, you know, what its energy infrastructure must be. I can influence, I can advise, I can bring the best expertise, but I also genuinely believe that, you know, at the end of the day, it's not for an international organization to tell a country what to do, but also to bring, you know, the evidence of success. I mean, one of the reasons why I think today we have seen just a couple of, uh, you know, weeks ago, 10 days ago, the president of, of China finally taking the next logical step, which is China will no longer finance coal-fired power stations abroad. Um, the fact that actually, you know, recent research from Boston University suggests that this notion that China was the single uh, reason why coal-fired power stations were still being built was slightly corrected by the fact that 60% of them are actually funded by banks and investment firms around the world, most of them actually in the West. So we still have a little bit of work to do, um, and I'm being slightly ironic here, with the finance sector, which is very often the subcutaneous driver of, of these decisions. And I think a lot more attention on the issue of financing um, will further strengthen the ability to not let these otherwise very narrow ways of, of, of rationalizing projects happen. But I'll, I'll stop here. I mean, I don't have a simple answer to you, Deborah, but I think at the end of the day, it's when we build movements in our societies and citizens actually become a politically powerful force, systems start um, adjusting, sometimes just you know, incrementally, sometimes fundamentally. And um, I think on the climate change front, we are seeing some of that happening uh, in many countries right now, which should be a cause for optimism. Okay, then thanks very much for, uh, for that, Akim. Uh, Deborah, we'll, we'll give you a chance uh, later on when we've maybe had some questions from the, the floor about, uh, uh, about what uh, Akim's been talking about. Just going to the uh, questions that we had from the floor, I think uh, there's one from Emily uh, Ruder there about uh, that idea that you presented early on about the need to move away from taxing, in a way, good resources like labor and move on to taxing uh, bad resources such as the use of uh, hydro carbons are on that but she's worried that that will somehow allow these bad practices to stick around longer it will somehow help them do you want to just tell us a little bit more about this idea because it's a pretty radical transformation of taxation systems that you're proposing um it sounds like a good idea to me but yeah if you could tell us a little bit more well i go back Oh, sorry, are you asking me or are you asking... Um... No, 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 I'm asking you. Emily's posed this question, yeah. Emily. Okay. Um, I'm just trying to quickly find it, Emily. Oh, right, yes. Um, well, look, sometimes we can simply outlaw or ban something. I mean, there was a point at which I um, sometimes I'm intrigued by how the debate about, um, you know, outlawing slavery was being conducted almost in recognizable terms how 20 years ago we were debating about you know the phasing out of fossil fuels yes it might kill people but that's the price we pay for development and you know slavery was a far more egregious and brutal illustration but there are parliamentary records of debates in the house of commons in the uk which were extraordinarily analogous to yes it's not something we really want but you know we need it for economic reasons so i think there are moments when something is simply wrong and you have the ability to, to stop it and ban it. Discrimination, gender discrimination, child labor. I mean, there are so many examples of that. Asbestos, you know, for years we had to struggle with some remnants in the asbestos industry or indeed lead in petrol, where just economic interests were preventing us from actually drawing the line and saying it's over. But, you know, when it comes to energy systems, I think, um, or indeed, um, how we uh, finance, first of all, uh, the fiscal space of government and you know, how taxation is generated in order to fund our infrastructure, our welfare systems and so on. I think we are at a point where 
we, we do have to make profound choices. They are literally paradigmatic shifts. And I was struck when a few years ago, Bill Gates said, you know, it's one of the odd things that um, in the way our tax system works, we tax human labor highly, but when a robot takes over that job, it's a capital investment and it's already a priori taxed at a fraction of what we tax a human being for doing the same job. And to me, that's a very you know, graphic illustration of the irrationality in a sense where our paradigms of fiscal policy taxation simply haven't caught up with reality, especially in a world where you know, finding jobs for young people is going to be a critical variable for many countries. And to also, you know, again, to Deborah's point, sometimes people are just reluctant to change because they are used to a certain system. We have to push much harder. I mean, there are many examples of environmental taxation already happening embedded in US uh, fiscal policy um, in the price of petrol in many European countries. I mean, we, it's not as if we are starting from scratch, but I think um, taxing the goods is not a very clever thing. And this is again, thinking in systems. So David, sometimes when we want to ban maybe a substance, a much easier way might be to put a price on it that simply makes it unattractive. And then those who, you know, for reasons that often elude maybe the rest of us want to kill themselves by continuing to breathe in lead in petrol or whatever. Um, okay, that's their choice, but it is no longer an imposition on society. And I think in that sense, sometimes economic instruments are a shortcut to achieving actually an outcome. And in that sense, I would say to Emily's point, it depends. Um, and I think we have the full array of toolboxes in public policy, and we need to use them with a kind of laser precision to quickly achieve an intended outcome. Okay, thanks very much for that. And that was making me think about taxation on tobacco and increasingly alcohol. And yeah, one can actually identify a set of uh, potential bads that one might want to uh, to work on. I wonder if we can move to, there's a question from Francesca Antonelli, and then I'll maybe move uh, to, to Jamie, um, who was a colleague at WCD. Uh, what Francesca's uh, asking, I was saying is that the hydro industry and financiers download responsibilities on assessment and system level assessments to governments, which are often short sighted um, on this. What could civil society do to push forward um, serious, transparent, dem democratic option assessment? Well, you know, you alluded earlier on, David, to um, when the WCD report came out, one of the things we observed was, let's say, the, the more conservative constituency amongst dam building uh, interests. And I use that term not in conspiratorial sense, but just, you know, there are firms who build them, there are financiers who fund them and so on. Essentially, um, converge on the World Bank as a way of lobbying precisely against that kind of um, more transparent and democratic option decision making, which is one of the regrets I still have to this day, because I think the World Bank, um, in the end, missed an opportunity at that time, which Jim Wolfenson had actually envisaged that, you know, the development space was becoming more and more contested. You no longer have an expert declaring what the right outcome is. The bank was convening partly out of its own painful experience around dam controversies, um, a process to arrive at a, a better framework for decision-making. And the bank, I think at that moment, blinked from actually making as part of its financing um, that public engagement a more integral part of the DNA of how options are assessed. Now, I don't want to singularize the bank, it's more an illustration of, of you know, missed opportunities, but at the end of the day, um, you know, the, the, the journey, the history of our societies is one of, you know, uh, continuously challenging the power of the state, but also, uh, you know, put the other way around, empowering citizens to have rights and to be able to have recourse in invoking those rights. And I think India is an interesting example during the WCD era, more and more development projects ended up in the courts of India. And you know, that clearly signals that something is not going well because if you, know, you essentially have to um, go to a judicial system to transact the decision over a project, you clearly have not established a decision-making process that is working very well. So India also established green tribunals and you know, started taking different approaches. 
Um, but it's an incremental process. And I think we will need to continue to push. And I think at the end of the day, to, to the point also earlier on, it's difficult for a developer to also be the arbiter on the options because a developer inevitably is already invested in a proposed idea. And that's human nature. We then will advocate for it. It's legitimate. That's why I believe government must take responsibility for um, you know, ensuring that an options assessment process is undertaken in an agnostic way with full participation and transparency in order to arrive at something that doesn't end up in a court and then is decided by a judge, uh, which is you know, not where development choices and decisions should really end up. Okay, thanks for that answer to Francesca's question. I wonder if we could call um, your colleague from 21, 22 years ago, Jamie Skinner, and Jamie's uh, made a, a note about uh, WCD proposing simultaneous water and energy planning. Um, that often doesn't happen, but uh, he, I think he could illustrate some of the potential. Jamie, can we um, ask you in just to make a comment and perhaps pose a question for uh, Akim? Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, hi, Akim. I hope you're doing well. Hello, Nice James. to see you. Um, I was just making the point that yeah, the World Commission on Dams did call for iterative planning of water, energy, food systems, um, but it probably fell on deaf ears at the time because we weren't able technologically to do that. We didn't have the, the modeling systems and the supercomputers that we have today. But um, the work that Julian Haru and his colleagues at Manchester have been doing make it now increasingly feasible to do very complicated options assessment um, with uh, both in both the energy and the water space and all the things that connect them. And my point was really just to flag that it's taken us 20 years to get to the software to be able to do the kind of thing that WCD was talking about, which sort of talks to your complex systems and the need for the technology to catch up with the aspiration. Um, so my point wasn't really anything other than to say that finally, <laughs> finally, after 20 years, we're getting to be able to deal with complexity in ways that we couldn't do 20 years ago. Well, I completely agree. And that's why I said, you know, right at the beginning, we, we have sort of the more paradigmatic equity sustainability drivers, and then we also have technology uh, in, in the way that it helps us to um, inform choices, um, make more optimal choices, be more aware of the costs of certain choices up front. And I think to take your point, Jamie, I would argue we have to even go beyond um, you know, the simultaneous uh, water energy planning. I mean, we are in a, in a, in a moment in time where you know, maybe carbon emissions will be the greater determinant or land use decisions will be the greater determinant. I mean, for instance, um, irrigation dams have sometimes been built even though they are not the optimal use of water, but food security considerations overrode that. Uh, the interests of local communities are deemed to be you know, subsidiary to the need to power a capital city. And I think that is where, um, you know, I think software development, you know, may sound very sort of geeky, but it actually allows us to um, make the consequences of different choices much more evident. And I think that is back to Deborah's point also, that's what people need. They need to have evidence, they need to have information so that they can make informed decisions. And then, you know, the political process unfolds. So I think the journey is one of managing ever greater complexity, but the return of that is that we can achieve ever greater returns on one dollar of investment, which is really where I come back to the DNA of the sustainable development goals. If you simply design a power generating infrastructure instead of thinking about how are we going to drive economic development, how are we going to reduce poverty, how are we going to create jobs, how are we going to maintain our ecological and biodiversity assets in a country, you start planning a very different set of infrastructure projects and investment paths. And that is, I think, really the development challenge of our time is to deal with complexity in terms of much narrower corridors in which we can still make decisions, but also far greater scope to make optimal decisions and hopefully with far fewer um, people paying a high price or indeed nature being lost in the process. 
Okay, I mean, thanks for that. I'll move on to one or two other questions so we can try and get to, to, to uh, I'm not going to get around to all of them. Um, uh, Jacques Leslie has uh, sort of pointed out that the World Commission on Dams uh, documented the methane emissions from reservoirs now with climate change, drought is threatened or flooding perhaps and having to release water and uh, increase uh, flood um, impacts. Uh, and so he's asked, is there any justification for large dams in this era of intensifying climate change? I suppose 20 years ago, people still thought they could use the last 50 years data as the next 50 years, but you'd have to be crazy nowadays to say, we'll use the last 20 years um, rainfall and uh, temperature data uh, for the next 20. Jack, very good to see you. And indeed, one of the, the wise um, analyses that, that emanated out of the WCD well beyond the report. And, you know, I still hesitate to, to arrive at a sort of summary judgment on dams. I think, first of all, you know, large dams are less and less likely to be an attractive investment simply because we no longer live in an age where 100 year floods and many of these hydrological design assumptions, you know, that govern a certain degree of predictability actually hold. And, you know, this was an experience I saw firsthand in the 10 years in which I lived in Kenya. Kenya was significantly dependent on hydropower and with, you know, ever more frequent cycles of drought, more uneven rainfall patterns. Uh, clearly, it could not build its energy economy around, um, you know, hydropower. It is still a part of the mix, but what Kenya then decided was to invest significant geothermal, which is a, you know, resource it has um, available um, in, in large quantities in the Rift Valley, and then in wind power more recently, and I expect solar will uh, follow very shortly. And that was, you know, just um, a perfect illustration of a developing economy where significant parts of the population do not have access to electricity, where electricity demand with development, industrialization, urbanization is growing exponentially, you had to essentially have a system switch. And that switch to renewables, sometimes against the advice I hasten to add of many of the international energy experts and agencies and funders, actually has enabled Kenya to now be a pioneer in geothermal and wind power, having, I think, even the largest wind power farm now on the African continent producing power. So from that point of view, I, I would still say yes. I think the, the era we are entering or that we are in is going to make large dams less and less likely, but that doesn't mean that there aren't large dams that would still make sense to build if, and this is a big if, and I know Deborah will be you know, raising her eyebrow, if we are able to demonstrate that we're able to manage that dam in a way that is compatible with social and, and environmental and ecological um, parameters that we are, in a sense, agreed are not peripheral, but central to the decision. So, you know, to somebody who is a student at your institute today, I would say, yes, if you are interested in becoming a dam builder, you are going to still have maybe a market, but frankly, your future is likely to be brighter if you don't build on dams as your career proposition but that's just my take <laughs> okay um we want to another one that's an interesting take on that one of the things that's intrigued me I've, I've visited china a couple of times talking about dams and that and it's realizing how different the syllabus is are uh, in universities depending on where you're up to and the fact that uh, yeah in chinese engineering education that's about building dams. And if you mention the idea of knocking dams down, um, it's barely covered at all because uh, yeah, they're in a different developmental and phase and have a different- I, If I could add a half sentence to that, and I, I use dam building deliberately, I think dam management is uh, probably going to be a very interesting area because you know there are tens of thousands of them. There is still maybe a few thousand are gonna be built and how to manage dams and how to then decommission dams, I think uh, probably is an area that is well worth looking at because it also speaks to perhaps what you do at the Global Development Institute, which is an interdisciplinary, a systems approach to actually managing you know, assets that already exist. And, and here, I think we have a lot to learn right through to how you finance the buyback of, of water and, and uh, ecological you know, environmental flows, for example. 
Yeah, no, no, indeed. We we wondered, we called ourselves future dams, which seemed a good idea, but we have tried to emphasize it's about building them, managing them better, and sometimes knocking them down. That's that is the uh, is the future. Um, we've got a a comment in from Pravin Karki and Jeremy Bird's taken up on it, probably the, the last one we may be able to get to about um you know how we look to dams to provide storage solutions for water and energy uh, rather than generation solutions or, or being seen uh, yeah in much narrower terms uh, i don't know whether you've you've seen the sort of point or the question but um certainly future dams we we've been surprised in some countries that the idea of certainly integrating um dams and hydropower with renewables and you know just these ideas and things which are happening nowadays floating uh, your solar panels on the dam which you can generate solar at the same time and uh, and, and maybe uh, reduce the uh, evaporation and that but these things are taking time and even this belief in some countries that you know, when you talk about host communities that may be displaced you have to give the electricity from the hydropower to them when in fact probably the easiest and cheapest way is before you build the dam just give them solar power and then, then they'd see an advance up front and it would be something you could integrate so yeah, how can we get this idea of uh, of storage forward well i think jeremy and greetings jeremy um is pointing to a very interesting phenomenon which i think as we go to scale with intermittent renewable energy um actually poses a new dilemma isn't it because the way you operate a dam and if you're you know i don't know how modeling would suggest um the the variability here but i mean you would have you know a dam not managed anymore traditionally by sort of rain rainy season storage a dry season release you would actually have to deal with an intermittent power regime that would demand you to essentially produce hydropower at very short notice in order to compensate. So that poses an interesting new challenge if one were to make um, you know, storage in terms of hydro, hydro dam storage, um, a significant backbone of um, a national power grid. I think, frankly, there will be countries where this is a significant opportunity in singular cases. I think what we are going to see far more is um, you know, the kind of, uh, mega grids that allow us to connect um, you know different geographies across long distances high voltage transmission technology obviously needs to evolve and just this week the uk got connected to norway i don't know some of you may follow this with the underwater power cable that allows norway to use its hydro uh, resources to produce um, you know green energy for the uk and the uk to also sell power when it has a lot of wind to norway or through I think, if I understood it correctly, through that cable into other grids in Europe. So, um, technology in the sense of dealing with the intermittent intermittentness of of power production is more likely to find perhaps um, solutions in that larger grid that can feed into it. Um, and at the same time, we have you know hydro hydrogen emerging as a potentially significant form of converting renewable energy into you know, transportable energy or storable energy. And I think there will be dams that will probably be justified in the next few years to be built because of, let's say, a role that they play in a transitioning energy matrix, whether uh, the cost and you know, the implications of a large dam um, is at the end of the day going to prevail, I think will be very, singular in terms of the, the the circumstances of that particular dam um, at the same time i think what um, will make dam building much more difficult in the future is just the economics and the more you incorporate the full cost accounting for a dam including in terms of the rights affected by those who simply didn't feature in a cost benefit analysis the, you know, the traded rights for environmental flows and ecosystem services, as they become more, you know, explicitly um, transactionable in a planning process, I think dam construction, in terms of large dams at least, will become increasingly challenging, which is also a small point just to make. I think, you know, sometimes we say large dams and hydropower are synonymous. 
there's a great deal of hydropower production that does not necessarily involve large scale or reservoir systems. And I think here there is perhaps significant potential, particularly in developing countries, as stepping stones towards a you know, more complex, sophisticated renewable energy infrastructure to look at you know, hydropower run of the river, smaller scale, that we could all invest a great deal more attention in and also resources in right now as part of the just transition, so to speak, that you know, we very often hear about in the climate change debate. Okay, uh, we've only got a couple of minutes left. Deborah, would you like 30 seconds just to make a final point? And then I'll go back to you, Akim, if you want to give us a, a final punchline or a final comment. Deborah. Oh, thanks. Yeah, thank you for including me. And it just as always on this topic of dams, it's a very lively, dynamic conversation. And, um, you know, I guess those of us on the outside will continue to do what we've been doing for decades, which is to hold people's feet to the fire, so to speak. And um, movement building is what we've been doing for decades. So that in some ways is not new. I was gratified to hear that the term trade-offs you've eliminated from your vocabulary and that you really are talking still about rights um, and responsibilities framework. And so I guess I urge you to continue to do that in the halls of power that you are in and that you do have that influence. Um, uh, so please take, take these ideas with you and, um, and continue to speak truth to power because <laughs> that's really what's needed. These movements have been around and um, we need change faster. Thanks very much, Deborah. Will Davsky coming in there. Akim, a, a final minute. Well, first of all, just to thank you, David, for you know giving me and us an opportunity to have such a, a fascinating discussion. <clears throat> Some of my friends and colleagues will remember that I think you all left um, that experience of the World Commission on Dams, and certainly for me, it was the most intense degree in development studies I have ever gone through because something that is a singular structure is a prism on just about every aspect of development. Um, human rights, economics, hydrology, um, you know, economics, um, power pricing. It's fascinating how one structure um, inserted into a system suddenly becomes really a magnifying glass on everything that is implied when we have to make development decisions. And um, to Deborah's point, it's also about political economy. It's about power or the lack of power. And here I speak about the power to choose or to refuse, not about electric power. And I would just urge you with the future dams project, first of all, dams will probably be built less and less, but to Deborah's point, probably too many are still on the you know, planning and drawing books that really have not been looked at in terms of their true merit. And that I absolutely can commit to Deborah. Um, speaking truth to power is uh, in a sense, an extraordinary opportunity I have with leading the development program. I always do it very much in the consciousness of both the issue and you know, the, the respect I have to have for countries who may make choices, but I think where UNDP truly is um, a useful variable, I don't want to overrate it, is that more often than not, we help countries to realize that there is power in people being engaged in development and in development choices and in development decisions. And you know, some want to just call it governance, others call it democratic governance, I think it goes deeper and I think if there is one thing that I'm sure future dams will also have um, honed in on, how is it that we can best make um, choices that are not choices of an elite, nor just of experts, but of the generation that now lives with both the responsibility to choose, but also the generation that will have to live with the consequences of it. And I think this is part of where development thinking and planning and decision-making has been profoundly shifted by an intergenerational dimension that I don't think was as clearly present um, maybe 20, 30 years ago to end where we started this discussion uh, at the beginning, David. And once again, it's been a great privilege to be with all of you. Okay, well, 
we're just running slightly over so i'd better say if people want to say thank you to to akim that's been great we've been throwing a lot of questions um at you and certainly the idea of past present and future you've taken us back into thinking about what's happening 20 30 years ago brought us uh, to the present and then also thinking about the ways in which uh, we might be able to move towards sustainability and dams water management and integrating water and energy might be part of that so thank you very much for that um, I just better remind people that the next webinar is in two weeks time when um, uh, Professor Julian Haru from uh, our, our engineering school at Manchester uh, will be talking about integrating uh, water, energy, food and environmental uh, elements into looking for climate adaptation and climate resilience. So he'd be looking at the possibility of these new models that can actually try to give us this more comprehensive analysis and try to show us the, the many choices that are available when water and energy are managed uh, along with food and the environment. Thank you all for coming and Akeem, thank you once again. That was really great. Thanks for launching the series. Bye-bye, all the best. Thanks Bye. Akeem. Bye.